Hi, today I'll be analyzing King Charles the First speech on the scaffold given outside the banqueting hall in Whitehall, London. Some context first: King Charles the First was a king who was unpopular among Protestant citizens because of his marriage to the Catholic princess Henrietta Maria. But what truly led to his execution later on was his tussle with the Parliament for power, which led to the outbreak of a civil war in England. which led to several deaths he was convicted of treason termed a tyrant traitor and murderer and sentenced to death by the parliament the following speech was given by him immediately before he was executed he starts by saying i shall be very little heard of anybody here i shall therefore speak a word unto you here indeed i could hold my peace very well if i did not think that holding my peace would make some men think that i did submit to the guilt as well as to the punishment so right in the beginning what king charles does is that he clarifies that the reason he is speaking is because his silence would mean submission to guilt it is important to note that king charles did not submit to the guilt because he did not have any sort of a plea in the trial at all in the trial for his execution or rather in the trial for his guilt for treason he did not accept the authority of the court over the king who was the divine authority and refused to actually give any statement or defend and hence now he is reaffirming that he is not submitting to the guilt but he thinks that it is his duty to god and that is what he firmly believed in that the king did not have to justify his actions towards anybody except god he says but i think it is my duty to god first and to my country for to clear myself both as an honest man and a good king and a good christian important words to note here he says that it is his duty to god because of which he is doing that nothing else is his compulsion he says it is my country he is not saying that he is no longer the king he is not saying that he is being removed he says very clearly it is my country and i am dutiful or i am rather duty bound towards my country to clear myself both as an honest man he says an honest man first again reaffirming that he is a honest man who is not guilty and then says and a good king and a good christian this is in contrast to what he was labeled as a tyrant traitor and murderer he begins with his innocence he says in truth i think it not very needful for me to insist long upon this for all the world knows that i never did begin a war with the two houses of the parliament and i call god to witness to whom i must shortly make an account that i never did intend for to encroach upon their privileges he says the world knows i never began a war with the two houses of the parliament again he is reiterating that his trial was unjust and his execution is unjust because the world knows that whatever he is being charged for is incorrect he says he calls god to witness because nobody else deserves to be witness here he is not obligated towards anybody else they began upon me it is the militia they began upon they confessed that the militia was mine but they thought it fit for to have it from me again the word confessed here indicates guilt on the part of the parliamentarians he says and to be short if anybody will look to the date of commissions of their commissions and mine and likewise to the declarations will see clearly that they began these unhappy troubles not i so that as the guilt of these enormous crimes that are laid against me i hope in god that god will clear me of it again he is clarifying the position that only god can judge him and god will clear him of these crimes that are laid upon him i will not i am in charity god forbid that i should lay it upon the two houses of the parliament there is no necessity of either i hope that they are free of this guilt for i do believe that ill instruments between them and me has been the chief cause of all this bloodshed important to note here how he says that the chief cause for the bloodshed 
is the ill instruments between them and me. He does not blame them directly. He does not blame himself directly. And this is a sort of a denial, but it's not exactly a denial. It is somewhat similar to what it is, what is referred to as now in political rhetoric as a non-denial denial. He is not saying that he is not at all involved. But what he is saying instead is that the ill instruments are to blame. It is not him to blame. So that by way of speaking, as I find myself clear of this, I hope and pray God that they may do. Yet for all this, God forbid that I should be so ill a Christian as not to say God's judgments are just upon me. What he's trying to say here is that whatever trial he was actually enduring was because of God himself and not because of these people who were his executioners. He is clarifying that only God had that authority over him. Many times he does pay justice by an unjust sentence. That is ordinary. I will only say this, that an unjust sentence that I suffered for to take effect is punished now by an unjust sentence upon me. That is so far as I have said to show you that I am an innocent man. By talking about how justice is paid by an unjust sentence, he is alluding to Jesus. He is alluding to how Jesus died because of an unjust sentence. And he says how that justice was paid by an unjust sentence. And that is an ordinary thing for God to do, for godly people. And that is something that is very important to note. Throughout this entire speech, there are undertones of him comparing himself to that situation. And he's comparing himself to a martyr. He's calling himself a martyr. And we'll come to that later. He then says, now for to show you that I'm a good Christian. I hope there is a good man that will bear me witness that I have forgotten all the world. And even those in particular that have not that have been the chief causers of my death. Now again, he's alluding to how Jesus forgave Judas and his executioners. Who they are, God knows. I do not desire to know. I pray God forgive them. But this is not all. My charity must go further. I wish that they may repent, for indeed they have committed a great sin in that particular. I pray God with St. Stephen that this be not laid to their charge. Nay, not only so, but that they may take the right way to the peace of the kingdom. For my charity commands me not only to forgive particular men, but my charity commands me to endeavor to the last gasp the peace of the kingdom. Very, very important to note how he says, I pray God with St. Stephen. St. Stephen is a martyr. He is a martyr as in he has witnessed Jesus. It is believed that Stephen, St. Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. These words also echoed the very words of Jesus on the cross. And Stephen said this when he was being brutally stoned. So now when King Charles actually says, I pray God with St. Stephen, Again, he's trying to bring forth this imagery of him being a martyr for Christianity, for people. So, sirs, I do wish it with all my soul and I do hope that there is some here will carry it further, that they may endeavor the peace of the kingdom. I would like to just bring to notice a few pictures that are great imagery to talk about how this entire comparison is being made. This painting that was painted, titled Charles I Insulted by Cromwell's Soldiers, is contrasted against the mocking of Christ. And these paintings are in a similar light. And it's basically to picture, it's basically to help people visualize Charles as somebody who was very alike Jesus, who was very alike the person who died for everybody's sins. And in that way, there's a deification that is taking place of the throne. And hence, his belief of the divine authority of the throne is being strengthened. Of course, this happened after his death. But then that is the entire point to royalty. Even after you die, you have a legacy and strength 
and that is carried forward by our successors. He then says, Now, sirs, I must show you both how you are out of the way and will put you in a way. First, you are out of the way, for certainly all the way you have ever had, yet, as I could find by anything, is in the way of conquest. Certainly, this is an ill way, for conquest, sirs, in my opinion, is never just, except there be a good just cause, either for matter of wrong or just title. And then if you go beyond it, the first quarrel that you have to it, that makes it unjust at the end that was just at the first. But if it be only matter of conquest, then it is a great robbery. As a pirate said to Alexander that he was the great robber, he was but a petty robber. And so, sir, I do think that the way that you are in is much out of the way. By talking about the conquest, he is also alluding to the conquest of power and of the throne. The parliament might not be seizing the throne, but they are effectively seizing power. And he says that by doing that, with unjust title, they are being like robbers. And they are being like great robbers, much like Alexander was. And in this way, he is mocking or rather insulting these people in a very nice way by calling them sirs, by being very polite and by making these allusions. But it is very clear that he is referring to the robbery of his power. He then says, Now sirs, for to put you in way, believe me, it you will never do right, nor God will never prosper you until you give God his due, the king his due, that is my successors, and the people their due. I am as much for them as any of you. Now, what he is trying to appeal to is the fear of God. He says that God will never prosper you until you do these things. And then he talks about giving the dues to three parties. Firstly, God, because obviously God should come first. Secondly, the king, who he places next to God, again reaffirming the divine authority. And then he talks about the people and he claims that he is as much as for the people as any of you. And he says that, again, in contrast to his terming, to his being termed as a tyrant. He says, you must give God his due by regulating rightly his church, according to his scripture, which is now out of order. For to set you in a way, particularly now I cannot, but only this, a national synod freely called, freely debating among themselves must settle this, when that every opinion is freely and clearly heard. This continuous repetition of the word freely is also alluding to how his own trial was not free. The people who supported the king were not even allowed to enter the trial. They were not allowed to give their opinions. The entire trial was hence, in a way, entirely biased against him. And maybe the only sentence that could arise out of it was a negative one which would call him a traitor. And that is why he's alluding to that as well by calling for a free debate on the matter of the scripture. For the king, the laws of the land will clearly instruct you for that. Therefore, before it concerns my own particular, I will only give you a touch of it. Now, the reason he does not talk about what the dues are towards the king, there could be multiple reasons. A reason could be that he already does not have any faith in them. They are already committing regicide. What can you expect from them anyway? Why waste my breath on them? Another reason could be that he believes that it would not be as impactful for the imagery that he's trying to create by talking about the king and by talking about his successors, which would be a conflict of interest because that is benefiting his successors. And thus, he skips over and then he talks about the people. He says, for the people, and truly I desire, desire their liberty and freedom as much as anybody whomsoever, but I must tell you that their liberty and freedom consists in having of government those laws by which their life and their goods may be most their own. It is not for having share in government, sir, that is nothing pertaining to them. A subject and a sovereign are clean different things, and therefore until they do that, I mean, that you do put the people in that liberty, as I say, certainly they will never enjoy themselves. He is clarifying his faith in the monarchy. He is clarifying his faith in a system that is not democratic by saying that a subject and a sovereign are clean 
different things. He says the liberty that he's talking about is the liberty of being a subject and of being different from the government. He says the people cannot be the government at the same time. And he's saying that again to reaffirm his authority, to reaffirm the monarchy's authority. He says then, Sirs, it was for this that now I am come here. What is this? This refers to proving that he is innocent and that he is a good man and that he is a good Christian. If I would have given way to an arbitrary way, for to have all laws changed according to the power of the sword, I needed not to have come here. And therefore I tell you, and I pray God it not be laid to your charge, that I am the martyr of the people. When he is referring to how he is not changing laws according to the power of the sword, he is again referring to his wrongdoers who did change the power of the laws by calling the king to trial, by charging him for treason, by having an obviously biased jury against him. All of that was done under the power of the sword. So he is referring to his wrongdoers here. And by, talk, by praying to God that it not be laid to their charge, he is again reinforcing his image as that of Saint Stephen, as that of Jesus, as that of a martyr of the people. He says then, In truth, sirs, I shall not hold you much longer, for I will only say this to you, that in truth I could have desired some little time longer, because I would have put this that I have said in a little more order and a little better digested than I have done, and therefore I hope you will excuse me. By saying this, he is also expressing humility in delivering what he has delivered. He says then, I have delivered my conscience. I pray God that you do take those courses that are best for the good of the kingdom and your own salvation. Jackson at this point says, Will your majesty, though it may very well be known your majesty's affection to religion, yet it may be expected that you should say something for the world's satisfaction in that particular. King Charles says, I thank you very heartily, my lord, for that I had almost forgotten it. It is important to note how he calls Jackson the Archbishop my lord, instead of using any other term. And this again is something that shows how much he supported that there be a proper hierarchy in the church and that the church be more sacramental in nature, that the church be different from what a lot of Protestants would want in that time. He says then, In truth, sirs, my conscience in religion, I think, is very well known to the world, and therefore I declare before you that I die a Christian according to the profession of the Church of England as I found it left me by my father. And this honest man, I think, will witness this. Sirs, excuse me for the same, I have a good cause and I have a gracious God. I will say no more. And then he says to Jackson, I have a good cause and a gracious God on my side. It is important to note how he says, the Church of England as I found it left me by my father. Because there was a lot of rumours and there were a lot of protests against him because of how a lot of people believed that he had left the way of the Protestant church and he had been influenced too much by his Catholic wife from France who was hated for her popery. So he clarifies and says that the profession of the Church of England as I found it left me by my father. And then he says the most popular line from this entire speech and he says I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown where no disturbance can be, no disturbance in the world. By the incorruptible crown, he is obviously referring to the kingdom of God and the crown of God. At the same time, he is calling his executioners corrupt who have now seized power and taken over the crown. He then says that there will be no more disturbance for me, no disturbance in the world. With the speech now ended on the note of crowns, let me bring attention to the frontispiece of Icon Basilisk, which was published on 9th February 1649, 10 days after the king was beheaded. This particular piece was called to be a spiritual autobiography of the king, and it not only justified the actions of the royalists, it also again 
along the lines of praying like St. Stephen asked that the executioners of the king be forgiven. We can see how allegorical this particular image is, where reference has been made to the divine crown, the incorruptible crown of heaven, and the crown of England that was already on his head, that was earlier on his head. And the words used here are that of vanity, as compared to the virtue that is there in the kingdom of heaven. We understand that through his entire speech, what King Charles does is that he builds this imagery and he builds this allegory of how he is similar to Jesus, how he is a martyr of the people. By doing that, what he is doing is that he is paving the way ahead for royalists. Even though he might be dying, it does not mean that his power has to end there. It does not mean that his influence has to end there. It does not mean that his legacy has to end there. And therefore, by interceding on the behalf of his sinners, by creating this image similar to that of St. Stephen or Jesus, he is establishing the divine right of the throne to rule. And at the same time, he is also helping the royalists justify their actions. And at the same time, he is also going ahead and creating a legacy that is unique. With that, we come to the end of this particular speech and this particular video. If you liked it, please hit the like button. And if you have any recommendations on what my next video should be, please feel free to leave a comment. Thanks a lot for watching.